I'm Father, I'm Father Rick, this is Father Mike. We are um, part of the OFMs, the Order of Friars Minor. Our, our headquarters is just in Manhattan, not too far from here. And we've been part of the Immaculate Conception Province of Friars for a little over 20 years each. Um, we work with Alex on um, the pilgrimage program. We take groups to Assisi and to Rome. And, and Father Mike is in Guatemala. He has uh, an orphanage. Um, that he takes care of about 250 uh, young people. I'm in, I'm in Boston um, doing some campus ministry at, at Boston University and helping the young men that want to become friars uh, in, in their formation. So we're happy to just come here to this beautiful school. We got a, we got a wonderful tour from the president himself, um, which was just really, really impressive at what's, what's going on here. I'd never been here before. I don't think either of us have. And uh, we're happy for this invitation to just share a little bit of, you know, our thoughts on Franciscan spirituality and education, and maybe stimulate a little conversation about uh, what's going on here, and, and maybe how how we might be able to get a, a little more Franciscan spirituality, kind of the spirit of St. Francis and Claire, uh, more fully alive in, in school. So uh, we're just here to help in any way we can. I'll turn it over to Father Mike. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, I think when I first got the invitation, I was thinking, oh, it'd be nice to kind of affirm, share something of our story, and especially in education, to help maybe uh, continue that beautiful way to evangelize through uh, education, allowing those Franciscan values to be infused in what you do. But I wanted to add uh, admiration, you know, like I was thinking, affirm and share. But what a beautiful job you're doing already, I have to say, like uh, here in the history that the president um, shared with us. And uh, when I was thinking about how, you know, in this short little time, how are we going to see something relevant and something you can walk away with? And I got an email last night, so I'd just like to share it with you, because I think if anything I was going to say, this probably kind of encapsulates what I think could be a nice message. And it was just a simple story. And it said, I was sitting at the window seat of the train, Headed home after a long day's work, this woman was writing, the man on the right came and plopped down next to me. He was annoyingly invading all of the personal space I was trying to have. <laughs> this irritated me to the point that I firmly yet gently elbowed him a few times to get him out of my way. Because his back was to me, I didn't realize that he was having some sort of mental breakdown until everyone else started moving away from him. He began to spit up and talk loudly. There I was, stuck by the window, unable to move. All the other passengers were looking at me like, dang, what are you gonna do? <laughs> Only thinking of myself, I quickly jumped over the back of the seat and moved away from him. Shortly afterward, the man on the left calmly walked up to the guy and spoke with him. He asked him his name and if he was high. The man said his name and nodded yes through tears and ramblings. The man then gently touched him and began to pray, not loudly or forcefully, but with a boldness and a fervor. Everyone on the train stood and watched quietly. There was this amazing peace that filled the space. In that moment, I knew that God was in the midst and I could see love being poured into the man. I was immediately encouraged by what I was witnessing, but also convicted of my own selfish motives to not be bothered. That's not to say that safety shouldn't be a concern, but it is to say that we sometimes have to take a deeper look. How often do we try to escape from those we deem unsafe or a nuisance when they are the ones who need Jesus the most? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. Really, I got that last night. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful opportunity. It speaks about what I think um, the opportunities that can happen in, a event, in how we can evangelize, you know, kind of like out of the classroom or the ways that we, we can infuse Franciscan spirituality, especially to the marginalized or the outcasts, those that are on the fringes, those that we like to kind of stay away from specifically. And I think um, that's, what Francis, that's a big part of the Franciscan charism. You know, allowing us to, in action, speak. That guy didn't preach. You know, what he did is he did something kind of mm -hmm. countercultural. He did something uh, maybe quietly, and it was perceived, of course, by this woman on a train. 
And when I heard President um, uh, Brendan speaking about how the Brooklyn Brothers have done that, they don't go around telling you what they do, they do it. You know, that famous Franciscan story of Brother Leo wanted to go preach. You know, I'm sure you know this, but it was Francis saying, hey, we're going to go preach. And they walk around Assisi all day, and they say, I thought we were going to preach. And he said, we just did. Meaning that beautiful phrase, you know, preach the gospel, and if you have to, use words. So what I think, when I think of teachers, educators, looking at you as um, being called, you have a vocation. You know, it's more than just the nine to two, that whatever you do in your classroom, I feel like it's a call from God, recognizing that he's placed you in this school, this Catholic school, to um, speak of him. You know, I think you have opportunities to do that. I always say in our school, we're not just there to form their minds, which is beautiful, important, math, all excellent, whatever, but we're there to form their hearts, which is another field. That, that means caring about the student more than their mind. You know, which of course that's very important for an educational institution, that's, that's good, not enough. I feel like you can do that in another secular university. Forming their hearts to understand a faith perspective, to understand that light of faith that illuminates them, helps them in their relationship with Jesus, with God. There's a beautiful document called uh, The Light of Faith, and it just has a beautiful line, and I think it's nice because it transcends not just the Catholic faith, it says, the light of faith is unique. It's capable of illuminating every aspect of human existence. It transcends everything. That's faith. That's a faith perspective. That's what I think we offer as a uh, faith-based institution. You know, it's something more than just a secular uh, facility. We offer an opportunity to grow in your relationship with God. And I think that um, richness in the Franciscan charism, we have a beautiful opportunity to evangelize in that. Um, the uh, Jesuits have kind of uh, eclipsed us in the academic world as Franciscans. Um, St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, uh, was a very organized man and, and the Jesuits who came after him fall, fall into a structure that's pretty clear and their universities do as well. St. Francis wasn't like that. St. Francis of, of Assisi was a man he was a simple guy um, who gave away his money and ended up taking care of the poor, and especially those who had leprosy, which was countercultural in, in his day. Um, institutions have sprung up that have the name uh, St. Francis or a Franciscan charism, um, but it's hard to follow a guy who wasn't that organized. In fact, at the end of his life, he actually stepped down from even leading the brotherhood that he had formed. You know, he started off, 11 guys joined him, there were 12 of them wandering around. By the time he died, there was 5,000 that were wanting to do, wanting to live the same way. And he said, you know what, I can't really do this. Someone else has to lead. I just want to step back and, as Father Mike said, um, lead by example. And that's what Francis did. There were a few things he, he insisted on, but just very few. When he gave advice of, of other people and the friars who came after him, especially Brother Leo, his good friend, um, Brother Leo wanted more of a structure. Francis, what should I do with my life? And Francis summed it up in, in one sentence. He said, follow the Lord Jesus Christ in his poverty in whatever way you're inspired and, and do that with my blessing." So to become a Franciscan, have a Franciscan heart, really that's all you need. You just need the desire to follow Jesus in his poverty. You know, Jesus had, had moments where he uh, was transfigured and he showed his divinity and he walked on water. That's not what Francis was about. He's not calling any of us to walk on water. But mostly the, the Lord Jesus was in his poverty was the one who stooped down washed the feet of his disciples, went to the uh, outcasts and those who, who felt alienated on the fringes of society, and, and Jesus showed them that they were loved, that they were good, that they were beautiful. In his poverty, the Lord Jesus let, let go of his power in order to serve. He made himself a servant, and St. Francis picked up on that. And he loved that, and he embraced it, and he made it happen again 
in 13th century Europe just by trying to, to live the message of Christ. So I think a, a Franciscan institution that, that tries to carry on this legacy really just need to be willing to reach out to those in need. Be willing to follow Jesus' uh, you know, example of humility and poverty. You don't even necessarily have to mention the name Jesus, as Father Mike is saying. You know, mm -hmm. to preach without words. Uh, Mother Teresa was, was so good. She's going to be canonized in September. We just heard. Very excited about that. Um, you know, and she and her sisters helped uh, the people who were um, dying to just die with dignity. She took them off the streets, gave them beds, and, and how they died in an atmosphere of prayer and love. And she showed Christ mm. to these people. Um, you know, she didn't have to preach the gospel to them. She, she you know, cared for sores and, and wounds and was a very Franciscan, very St. Clair-like woman um, in her day. And I think, um, you know, the challenge, and maybe we can talk about it, is, you know, how to translate that into uh, an academic setting, into uh, an atmosphere where people are learning and, and studying and trying to make a name for themselves, how to remember, how to remind them and how to lead them to be humble, you know, to use the gifts we've been given in a role of service, not to dominate, you know, the, the message we'll get from the rest of the world, the message your students will get from the rest of the world is, Step on people and get to the top, you know, climb your way to the top. Um, an institution that, that takes the name of St. Francis has to have the opposite message. Yes, you're wonderful, you're gifted, you're intelligent. Use those gifts to serve, to, to make a difference. Use your gifts to, to reach out, especially to those who don't have the opportunities you have, and maybe help them see the dignity that God has given them. Um, I like that uh, light of faith image. Um, you know, like light is something you can't see. You can't just see light. You know, but it allows you to see everything. And without that light of faith, you're in darkness. You know, that idea of um, being having a vision of faith, it's different. It's looking at the world different. We have a sacramental vision. That's part of our tradition, our Christian tradition. It's looking at the whole world different. It's a different faith perspective. Even when it comes to creation, for instance, Franciscans look at creation as a sacrament, meaning every single thing in reality speaks or points beyond itself. You know, it speaks of God. And the principle is so simple, meaning if you're an artist, that art necessarily speaks about you. Has to. You made it. So art speaks about the artist. Well, so too, creation speaks of the creator. Now, that's a language maybe we don't know, but that's something we can infuse. That's something we can teach. It's a language you can get acclimated to so you can see the whole world in a different way. That the mountains, the trees, the birds made by God speak, somehow say something about Him. So it's a vision. That's what faith is. It's a light. It's a way of seeing. And to make it more practical, Francis had that vision. He was a man who had that faith perspective. When he went to speak, to uh, one of the cities, I think it was in Gubbio, the people were really known as like being really mean, bad. You know, they were like uh, morally kind of corrupt. And he went there and he stood up and he went, Buongiorno, buona gente. Good morning, good people. They were good people. They knew they weren't good, you know? But he was able to see the goodness in themselves. <coughs> and uh, one of my favorite characters from literature is Don Quixote, if you're familiar with him. Kind of crazy, beautiful vision. And if you know that story with him and Aldonza, the prostitute, he went up to him and he said, my lady Dulcinea, you know, the most beautiful woman in the land, I will fight for you, you're on. And she was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm a prostitute. He's like, no, you are the lady Dulcinea. You are the most beautiful woman in all the land. She's like, nope. <laughs> wrong, wrong, you know, wrong woman. But he insisted, insisted, insisted. His vision awakened within her her own goodness, her own beauty, that she too was a child of God. Huh? He was able to see and awaken her goodness. And what is that story about? By the way, Miguel Cervantes, you literature professors, you know, third order Franciscan. You know what that, you know what that story is about? Jesus and Mary Magdalene. 
that he was able to awaken. He was able to see the saint in the sinner. That's a vision. huh? Not only who they were, what they could become. That's a, a perspective you're not going to find in your curriculum, you're not going to find in your job resume. You know, no, what a beautiful way you can show people their goodness. And I'm sure you're aware of that study, psychological study, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, when they put the students, the good students in the back, the ones who weren't so good in the front, and they told the professors opposite. So what happened is the expectation of the instructor was such that they expected those in the front to answer all the questions, and what happened? They started answering all the questions. You know, self-fulfilling prophecy. Seeing the good in that student, huh? I remember uh, one of my, having, uh, with uh, Miss Garcia, fourth grade, uh, we had had a lunch fight, uh, like a food fight downstairs, you know? We were called up, and Miss Garcia lined us up, and she was like, I, is there Miss Garcia here? <laughs> she's like my favorite teacher in the whole place. She lined us up and she was yelling at us, you know, one by one. It was all the boys. We had like we threw out food. And she got to me and she goes, And you, Michael, I am so surprised at you. And I was like, Really? I was like, I was the, I was the first one throwing the food. <laughs> but all of a sudden to me it was like, wow, I was supposed to have been better. In her eyes, I'm better than that. And I started acting like that. I was like, wow, like I'm supposed to be good. You know, but her encouragement, her vision of me, wow, it made me feel like I can be better. You know, I'm supposed to be better. People think I'm better, you know? And uh, that's what you can do as an instructor. You know, you can awaken or see the goodness in them, even when they can't. You know, and what a beautiful legacy you empower that student with. You know, to see their own goodness, their own beauty, they, they don't feel lovable. You can reach out, especially that student that's maybe alienated, isolated. You can go and find them and bring them closer huh? by your love. And that's the vocation I think uh, the Lord calls you to, you know, invites you to. A couple of uh, early Franciscans to just talk about a little bit. One of them was St. Anthony. Um, you may have heard of him. He got so popular, he kind of eclipsed St. Francis for a while. Um, but he was already a priest and already a, a canon regular um, when some of the early friars uh, died. They gave their life to, to spread the faith. And Ferdinand at the time was impressed by that and he wanted to be a Franciscan. So he took the name Anthony and he became a, an early friar. And he asked for permission to teach the brothers' theology because he was already learned and, and this was just kind of a ragtag group of, of men from Assisi. And St. Francis wrote him a little letter and said, absolutely, Brother Anthony, I, I give you permission to teach the brothers' theology. As long as with study of this kind, you don't extinguish the spirit of prayer to which everything else must contribute. That was the one concern of Francis. They could study, but to study in a spirit of prayer. To study, again, if you study in a spirit of prayer, the humility is going to be there. Without prayer, you can maybe get a little arrogant and again start to think of how you can wield your knowledge or use it for your own uh, advantage or to take advantage of other people. Francis wanted everything to lead us back to God and flow from God. So a few years later, another friar comes on the scene, a man named Bonaventure, and he's given uh, leadership of, of the friars. And um, Bonaventure is a brilliant mind, a brilliant theologian, and um, just a great thinker. Um, he puts into writing, into many volumes of writing, uh, this Franciscan intuition that study must be, um, must submit to prayer. So if you look at any of, of Bonaventure's works, they start off with a page that says, you know what, before you read on, fall on your knees, or, or go before God, say a prayer before you read what's coming up. That, as if he wanted our hearts to be like fertile soil, so that something planted from heaven would really take root and, and thrive. So he, he, Bonaventure encouraged his audience uh, uh, to be prayerful, to go before the Lord, reflect a little bit, 
Think about who we are as creatures created by a loving God. Think of what Jesus Christ did to save us and set us free. And then pick up and read in that context. So a, a Franciscan way to study uh, is going to involve prayer. St. Bonaventure called it, it's idle curiosity, he said, to want to know anything apart from its relationship to the Creator. And so he felt that anything, if you were studying biology, if you were studying molecular science, if you were studying botany or anything, if you got, the, got how a science worked, Bonaventure said, you could retrace it back to the Creator who gave it to us. And he said, that's the way to study, to see everything as having flown from a, the heart of a loving God, and that everything has the potential to lead us back to God. So, you know, modern debates about like science versus religion, this would have been inconceivable to a, a 13th century theologian like Bonaventure, because science proved God, everything in the natural world that has laws and that follows from, from certain laws came from the mind of a being who wanted us to share the joy of creation with him. So a Franciscan way to study is to see that and maybe kind of instill that in, in others that let's do it, let's dive into medicine, let's learn everything about the human body and how it works and then step back and and pray about why we have two eyes and two ears and a body that functions and who dreamed this up? Um, who came up with this elaborate system of a body that something breaks down, something else picks up and then fills in for it? Let, it? let it lead you to a sense of awe, to step back and see that, again, the Creator's signature is on everything in creation. And science doesn't disprove God, it proves God. I would just add on with a story and uh, some maybe offer some questions. Um, but picking up what he said, I like that because he said um, we Franciscans believe creation is God's first Bible, you know, and it's reading um, what we have here to to see and meet God. There's a great story of uh, Dr. Paparos. I don't know if you ever heard this one, and uh, he was given a big lecture in a hall, and it was these very you know intellectual people, and one guy raised his hand. He says, you know, Doctor. Um, What's the meaning of life? And so everybody laughed. You know, the meaning of life. And so he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to answer that question. And he says, when I was a young boy, I was going around in the forest, and I came across a shattered uh, mirror from a German uh, motorcycle. And it was just a little piece of mirror. And so I picked it up, and I used to play with it as a child. I would go around and try to shine light into little in accessibly, you know, dark places, and that was what I do in my spare time, and as I grew, he said, I realized that it wasn't just a game, it was something I could do with my life, because what he realized is, he's not the light or the source of the light, but what he could do is shine God's light into dark places in the world and in the hearts of people, so that what his metaphor for life was, was allowing um, his, you know, teaching his uh, life to be a way that conveys the truth of God to others. And he said, I can shine it in some, you know, some people and change some things at some time. And I thought that's beautiful that, you know, we recognize that that's what you can do. You know, that's the power of an educator, uh, that you're able to really convey, you know, that which is not our, we're vessels. You know, that a beautiful image, I think, of teaching is, you know, not only <coughs> like, those minds are empty vessels, but rather they're, um, you know, uh, we can ignite the fire. We can be inspirations to others. Not just shoving information, but really our aim is transformation of hearts, conversion. You know, it's not just disseminating the truth, putting information, whoosh, stick it in their mind. No, no, no. We're up to light their hearts on fire for God. And you do that best by your faith. You know, you really can't give what you don't have. So that first day, if they feel like, you know, that prayer, that life that, you know, is not infused in us, they're going to smell it. They know it. There's no relationship there. You know, whereas if you have it, it's going to be imbued with everything that you do. You know, they're going to know that. So I think you're, like our Parker Palmer, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a beautiful writer. 
that tries to speak about faith and education, and he talks about what you communicate by who you are. You teach who you are. You know, meaning that if you have it, uh, you can, they'll catch it. You know, they'll see that in your life and in your teaching. And uh, one of the things I believe about educators is, number one thing, you have to be good learners. You know, and if you don't impart the love of learning, I feel like we're really missing out on a beautiful opportunity to just teach you one subject is good, but to engender a love of learning, much better. You know, that you inspire them to have that love, which means, we have to be learning all the time, you know, and I always ask my teachers, you know, what have you learned from your students, you know, this year in your classroom? And as a disciple, that word means to be a learner, right? It's beautiful. Education, I love that word. It means a ducere from the Latin. It means to lead out of. That's the Latin word, a ducere, to lead out of. Where are you leading the students? You know, out of ignorance to what? To whom? You know, it's the question, really. So maybe we can, you can reflect on that. You know, like, how am I leading others to God? What a beautiful gift I give them if I am a beautiful example of learning. You know, then they, you love to learn. What did you learn today? You know, then I say, wow, my teacher loved to learn. And I've had teachers like that. It's so dynamic and attractive. And, and you, you give them that. You spark it. They have to catch it, you know, from you. So I think um, your witness you know, never underestimate it. Your witness is powerful. You know, they get it from me. I remember so many teachers in my life that have impacted my, my uh, they formed me. You know, so you are forming them. I always say, everybody's a leader. You know, the question is, where are you leading them? You know, and how are you doing with that? So you are leading with it. They're taking that cue from you. You know, so we have an opportunity to um, lead them to Christ, lead them to faith, lead them to Him. I was thinking of uh, Peter, who was the custodian in, in the grammar school um, where I grew up in Boston, and he had, um, was Pietro, he could, had come over from Italy, and his, his English was very limited. And um, just a, a very jovial guy, always with a smile on his face, always working, always with his sleeves rolled up. And one time, myself and a few friends, I don't know, fifth or sixth grade, um, we, we just got to watch him. Um, he had to take apart a sink and get somebody's ring out of the pipes and everything. And, and I just remember he took the time to explain to us in his limited broken English what he was doing and um, the joy that he had in doing this, like the, the dignity, like he was teaching us, you know, whatever we were, 12 year olds, how to take apart a sink. When I think back on all my years of grammar school and high school, I don't remember all my teachers. I remember some, but I'll never forget Peter. And I came across a quote not long ago that's always stuck with me. People will forget what you say to them, but they'll never forget how you make them feel. I think of Peter as a Franciscan. Um, a humble, simple, beautiful man, joyful, ready to share what he had. How awesome would a, a school be if everybody just wanted to share what they had? That's, of course, how awesome would a world be if we all did that, right? But that, I think, really captures the, the Franciscan charism. We don't have to be anyone else or compare ourselves to anyone else. We all have gifts. We all have talents. What if we joyfully decided to share them with one another? We might just have heaven right here on earth. We wouldn't have to go much further than our own uh, front door to see that. You laughed there, I know, so I, I told you I was going to start laughing. But it remind me, I heard a great conference, just one insight uh, I, that I learned from this guy. He, is, uh, he was so, um, he had a doctor in something, he was so erudite, he spoke so well, articulate, beautiful, but he said, you know what I realized? My learning is not for me. You know, and I thought that was a great thing. It's not to make my head bigger above whatever he says. It's all, like all gifts, St. Paul tells us, they're for others. So all the learning in this room, I bet there's a bunch, it's not for you, it's for others. You know, sharing that generously, using what God has given you, the talent in this room, the intellectual the experience, the knowledge, the degrees, it's to help others build up the community. So if we remember, like, we're entrusted with that for others. That's a beautiful, like, uh, generosity 
that we could give, and it's like kind of step back and say, hey, you know, it's not that I'm, I'm the expert on the subject, it's I get to help others. And I think that's what Pete maybe was doing, like, you know, sharing what we have and helping others lead them. Amen. Thanks for listening. Oh, so much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We'll, all, we'll go all day. No, I'm not <laughs> No, um, you won't. Just some, some practical things as a conversation starter um, that, you know, Father Mike and I were, were thinking about. Just want to throw these things out. Um, maybe one or more of them stirs something up in you for a further conversation. In, in places we've been involved in, the different ministry that the, the friars are involved in, these things have, have worked to some degree or another. Again, I was impressed with the tour and how, how much outreach is already happening in the school. Um, we've had uh, prayer, prayer chains or prayer groups where um, you get some kind of image, whether it's a, a crucifix or a, or a statue or something, and you get a, a group of people to gather around it and pray, offer whatever intentions they have, ask, ask for help from God. And they're kind of in charge of that statue or whatever it is for the week. And then they pass it on to another group. And that group can kind of be seen as the kind of the prayer warriors for the week. You know, you could maybe even come up with a, a list of if someone has intentions, oh, let me go see what the, the prayer warriors are up to, you know, or, or bring this intention to them. And the statue kind of goes from, from group to group. Uh, it, it's a possibility to get some, some more prayer happening. Um, we've had um, bereavement and loss groups, which are very, very powerful and very needed um, when people can come together and just know that they can share in a safe place about some loss they've experienced. And you can do that beginning and ending with a prayer, you know, in a context of, of prayer. Um, mission trips. I've been involved in a bunch of mission trips with Boston University and other universities to um, countries uh, outside the country, but, but also like, like, you know, Father Mike has a beautiful place in Guatemala, if anyone wants to help him out there. We have eight universities come in this year, it's a win-win, they've been amazing, we bring college students there, it's uh, fabulous, yeah. transformative. I did a, a mission trip with Franciscan University of Steubenville students out of Ohio to Chicago, where um, there's, uh, there's a house, they call it a Emmaus house, and they try to get men off the streets who are, um, have you know, been pulled into a life of drug addiction and, and even prostitution to support their drug habits. Just you know, some horrible situations, but Emmaus House um, has set up a place where they can go and it's a, it's a safe place. There's, um, we cook a meal for them and invite the men to come in and just kind of get out of that. And, and you know, when I was there, it was so powerful because I, these men had never, seen someone who didn't want to use them or take from them and the volunteers were just there to give. Um, simple things we've done in Franciscan fraternity, we've done things like Lent or Advent angels, you know, where you, you put everybody's name in a hat and you draw a name out and that's, that's the person that um, is your Lenten angel or your Advent angel and for that beautiful period of time we were preparing for Christmas or preparing for Easter you have one special person that you you commit to praying for every day, and then maybe do some nice things. Maybe you leave a, an encouraging note in a locker or something, or just whatever may, may be um, you know an inspiration. Um, and of course, faith sharing, Bible studies, even uh, some of the saints that I've mentioned, or other um, writings from the church or whatever. We, people could come together and discuss um, the writings. Pope Francis is giving us wonderful stuff in my house right now where we're reading God's Name is Mercy and we read it together. It's from Pope Francis. It's amazing. When you think you're beyond mercy, when you think your sins are too great, they didn't know my, well, my sins when they talk about God being merciful. Mm -hmm. You know, then you start reading what Pope Francis is saying and you realize God's mercy is for absolutely everyone. All we have to do is a, a little turn in God's direction, and God comes to us, like the beautiful parable of the prodigal son. He doesn't even wait for the son to come home. He runs out, and he greets the son in the field. I think Pope Francis is really doing a great job of capturing the, the mercy of God and how that's for everyone. So those are just a couple of practical ideas and possible conversation starters of things that might be able to happen here at St. Francis.